Good morning to everyone. I certainly hope all of us find a way to enjoy the day. And with that in mind, if you'll uh, join me with our opening words, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be in it. Um, I do want to encourage you to take time to look at the announcements uh, in the bulletin. Um, I want to welcome those of you who are visitors with us. Um, we thank you for your presence among us. We thank you for your contribution to public worship. We do hope that you find uh, a welcome place here. And to those who are watching online, we also extend a warm uh, welcome to you, and we're glad that you're joining us in that way. Um, I want to call attention to um, uh, the death of Bill Dixon, and I want to say that um, Bill Dixon had a huge, huge influence on my own life. I'll call attention to two aspects. Uh, Bill had a hearty laugh and liked a good joke. And uh, I have always seen laughter as a sign of spiritual uh, health and maturity. Uh, how many of you know and can recall Bill's laugh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a gift, a spiritual gift of merriment. The second gift is, and I've told this to Kathy, I think I see Kathy and the family there. Um, he reminded me of something uh, that was part of my own early ministry, was kind of a fire of compassion for others in need that led to my first job working in um, the inner city, led to another job where I worked to help develop ministries uh, within the community of Hammond, Louisiana. Uh, but I've always thought about as a retire, what am I going to do with my life? And I watched Bill here in his commitments to expressing his sense of justice for all through the various activities uh, that uh, he did. And uh, in light of that, um, we are just happened to have a new worship series starting uh, next week, uh, focusing on prophetic speech and prophetic imagination because the lectionary passages are dedicated to Jeremiah. So I've begun a Sunday school class today that will be focusing on prophetic speech and prophetic imagination, uh, of which I think Bill displayed for all of us. And in honor of uh, him, I would encourage some of you who really resonated with his commitments to come and join our discussions. Um, he's a great dude, great dude. Can we say amen? amen. Um, I want to call Kathy Black up, who's going to offer us a word from Sisters of Faith. And then, Jim, if you'll be ready to follow right behind her. Good morning. A sweet friendship refreshes a soul. This is Proverbs 27, 9. My name is Kathy Black. I am here today to share a wonderful program for the ladies of WPC called Sisters in Faith. Each lady should have received a letter, invitation letter in the mail, and a green commitment card. Sisters in Faith provides an awesome opportunity for the women of WPC to connect with one another to form new friendships and strengthen existing ones. You will be matched with another WPC sister and have the opportunity to nurture an individual friendship and as well through the larger group attend monthly gatherings. We have a great time. It is a blessing to have the extra love and support of a caring friend. This program has been going strong in this church for over 16 years. My sisters over the years have been solid friendships for life and have meant so much to me. We are honored to have our own Reverend Richard, over here somewhere, Richard uh, Kleiman as our keynote speaker at our kickoff luncheon on Sunday, September 18th. So we're looking forward to that. Please sign up. Um, commitment cards will need to be returned by Sunday, August the 28th. If you need a card, please look for Evelyn Timmons, Margie Fulton, or myself, and we will get you a card and a copy of the letter if you don't have one. Again, a sweet friendship refreshes the soul, Proverbs 27, 9. I'm looking forward to growing our sisterhood. Thank you very much. Good morning again to everybody. I am uh, Jim Cooper, 
And on behalf of the nominating committee, I wish to thank everyone for your submissions and find a roll form. We are ready to start proceeding with doing selections. This does not let you off the hook, so you can't wipe your brow right now. Okay. We are looking for it and considering what we're going on. If you have a contact or whatever you need to talk to, you can talk to contact Kathy Breyer, Missy Rohr, Joe Swartz, Dennis Weiner, or myself, Tim Cooper, with your nominations and, and stuff. We ask you, we thank you for your prayers, and we ask you to continue praying for Western Presbyterian Church, church offices, officers, and also for the nominating committee as we go and we make the choices that's going to sustain Western Presbyterian Church for the next three years. Thank you. Good day. Thank you, Jim. If you do get called to serve as an elder or deacon, I want to encourage you to take it to heart. The congregation is inviting you to assume a, a role of leadership for a temporary period of time. And um, it's a great invitation and I, I hope that you will take it to heart if you are invited. Um, here's the grace words. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. Let us continue our worship. Please join me in the call to worship. O oh God, you are my God. I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. Let us pray. God of hope, comfort, and restore all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. May they know the power of your healing love. Make us willing agents of your compassion. Strengthen us as we share in making people whole. Amen.
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sins to God. Gracious God, source of all life, Lord of mercy and grace, hear our prayer. We come before you in need of healing, the healing of our bodies and souls, the healing of our relationships, the healing of our pride and fear and apathy. We know that with you nothing is impossible, not even our healing, not even the restoration of the whole world. We pray that you will heal us, that you will heal our world, so that we will be freed to serve and love and dream and be as Christ calls us. Amen. Now, let us go to God in silent confession. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ, and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen.
the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus so that together you may with one voice glorify God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us pass the peace. Time now to have all the children come up, please. I know we have several this week. That's really cool. If you'll line up around the table. Okay, some of you already know this, but we're going to go through it again. Whose table is this? Okay, and whose, whose table is it besides God's? Who's welcome here? That's right. So I want you to repeat after me. We're going to try to do this each week. This is Jesus' table. He set a place for me. Come on up. And everyone is welcome to come and taste and see. All right. We're going to get to know that. Now, Sophia, would you be my reader? Okay, in just a second. Everybody else, in a minute, I want you to act like you're writing a letter. Okay? Just pretend in your mind that you're writing a letter. Okay? All right. Last week, and you all weren't here, but last week, a leader of the Jewish people, the Christians who were starting out, the leader wrote a letter to the people in this church. And he wanted them to remember all the people who had trusted God and had faith in them. So in that letter, this is what he wrote afterwards. Would you please read that out loud? My father, Mouse, Moses, in the illustrates across through the Red Sea on dry land to escape slavery in Egypt. Egyptian. But yeah. she, what she was telling you is by faith Moses and the Israelites crossed the Red Sea on dry land to escape slavery in Egypt, but the Egyptian army was destroyed. By faith, Joshua and the Israelites marched around the walls of Jericho until they fell down. By faith, Daniel was not harmed when he was thrown into the lion's den. By faith, others who were hurt and were made fun of kept their faith strong and kept believing in God. So that's what he wrote to them the second time. Okay, now, I want all of you to just write a letter to somebody. Just, you know, just go ahead. Because what we're trying to remember here is what we call a great cloud. You all know what clouds are, right? Okay, they're big and they're really beautiful up in the sky, whether they're dark or white or whatever. Well, we talk about a cloud of witnesses. Now, all that means, all the people who have gone before us, all your relatives and friends who have already died, they are up there looking at us. They're in the cloud of witnesses. As Pastor Keith was talking about, we go to those people Think about them in our memories and in our hearts, and we try to do what they did. They are witnesses. They, are, they show how we're supposed to act. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so if your parents are doing something right or wrong, a lot of times the little ones will do what they do. We hope it's the right stuff. But that's exactly what we're talking about in the faith. We want to watch adults when we're children, see what they're doing, and try to do the same thing, okay? So that we end up being good Christians too, okay? All right, let us pray. God, we are strengthened by the faithful people who stood strong with you through good and bad. bad. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, Let us pray. Gracious God, we do thank you for the prophetic witness that we find in the life of Jesus. 
along with his mentors, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Micah, Zephaniah, and so on. We thank you that there is a place in the church for speaking, as we say in modern terms, speaking uh, truth to power. We confess that uh, we often are not prepared to hear prophetic speech or to engage a prophetic imagination with all of its judgment and sometimes condemnation of the way life is being lived. But nevertheless, we acknowledge that in the scriptures we do have a prophetic witness and that we recognize that in addition to Jesus being a pastor and a priest, he clearly was a prophet. And so we look for you through the scriptures today to remind us of his prophetic ministry and as a consequence of our prophetic calling. Uh, hear our prayer of illumination. Um, we pray in the holy name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and all the people together say, Amen. We are going to begin a series, uh, actually a week early now, uh, on prophetic speech and prophetic imagination. The word prophet in Hebrew is nabi, in plural, nabi'im, which literally means truth teller. Uh, the majority, the largest section of the Bible is, uh, is the prophetic writers, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and what are called the minor prophets, the shorter ones. Uh, the most influential person in the life of Jesus was the prophet Isaiah. And in some ways, uh, we get in the way Jesus lived, the influences of his spiritual mentor, Isaiah. Uh, Presbyterians don't usually tolerate very well uh, preaching from the prophets. But in our lectionary, we are up against um, some prophetic teachings of Jeremiah. And so for a few weeks, we're going to focus on uh, prophetic speech and prophetic imagination. And hopefully, as we roll along, uh, we, will, we will get a sense of that. Before I read um, the gospel passage that is set for the day, I want to uh, give you a little taste of uh, what a prophet's psychology is like through hearing a few words from Jeremiah. And I want to remind you that Jesus had this same psychology. So in chapter 20, beginning with verse 7, hear these words. O oh Lord, you have enticed me, and I was enticed. You have overpowered me, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I must cry out. I must shout violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, then within me is something like a burning fire. Shut up in my bones. I am weary and cannot hold it in. I cannot hold it in. And then turning over to the Gospel of Luke is a very difficult passage. It's an indication of Jesus' prophetic ministry, the part we don't listen to very much. This is not the Jesus meek and mild that you've seen in the paintings in Sunday school rooms. This is Jesus, the tough guy, speaking truth to power. And one of the consequences of his prophetic ministry, instead of sometimes bringing peace, he creates division. So hear these words from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 49 through 56. These are the words of Jesus. I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. 
From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say it is going to rain, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Our second letter is about a church. Uh, Titus is writing to a, yet one more congregation in the New Testament that has difficulty actualizing their vision. Um, they are, have a provisional witness, but not a pure witness. 
and he has just given some advice uh, on keeping up the good work. This is Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Hear God's word. Remind me to be subject to rulers and authorities. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show every courtesy to everyone. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, despicable, hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us from that old life, not because of any works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, through the water of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. This Spirit he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is sure. I desire that you insist on these things so that those who have come to believe in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. But avoid stupid controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. After a first and second admonition, we have nothing more to do with anyone who causes divisions, since you know that such a person is perverted and sinful, being self-condemned. Uh, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I, I mentioned Bill Dixon, and I do want to lift up to him as witness may be odd for his wife and for his children to hear me say some things, but uh, Bill really did have a huge influence on me. He and I had somewhat of a, ser a, a similar story in our progression on um, just the way we look at life and the way we understand the faith. Um, but, but Bill had the heart of a prophet. And it was evidenced in things that he committed to in his retirement. He may be the only Presbyterian that I know that worked with the ACLU. He was dedicated to getting many of us to go down to the border uh, and to bring needed supplies to, to people uh, from other countries who were burdened by their journey and by the politics of the day. I remember him telling me a story about uh, tampons and a question came about whether the tampons were offered to legals only or illegals. The horror of such a question. He dedicated himself to interfaith caring ministries. Um, what caught me so much though was his passion. It was the same fierce passion that I alluded to in the book of Jeremiah having something burning so deeply inside that you just had to do something about it. We started a class today on a conversation about prophetic imagination and prophetic speech, but it's just a class. If none of us act on it, then all we're engaging is nothing more than wishful thinking. And I got a sense that Bill had no patience for that kind of Christianity. He wanted to be very much like Millard Fuller and Linda Fuller, the founders of Habitat for Humanity, the theology of the hammer. He wanted to do um, God's work with his own hands, through his own heart, and he prayed by walking to people in need. We are entering a period when we begin to focus on prophetic speech and prophetic um, ministry or imagination. For whatever reason, most Presbyterians do not tolerate the language of the prophets. 
For one thing, it challenges the politics of individuals, the economics of individuals, and especially the commitment to the reality of our conviction as Christians that everybody has the image of God imprinted on their being. Therefore, there's a certain kind of ethic that emerges about how we are to treat people, especially the others. When I was taught preaching, one of the ways that I was taught was through what was called narrative preaching. My story, your story, our story. So I want to start with my story a little bit and work to your story, to our story. On the way here, I was listening to a podcast. It's called Renovare or Renovation. It was formed by Richard Foster, who was a Quaker. And it's a deeply and profoundly uh, spirit-oriented, Quaker-like oriented, gentle, peaceful kind of Christianity. It's, uh, it's the, the story about the inner life that we need to discover within ourselves and the inner fire and the inner light that drives us uh, to, uh, to love. It's a, it's a, a community of, of focusing on the best practices on how to do Christianity. It was through Richard Foster, when I was a young man, that my early Christianity really took some root. Richard Foster talks about the six different ways that people seem to be Christians. Some of us are really dedicated to prayer, which means to be attentive to God, focusing um, our deep spiritual sensibilities on the great beyond that comes in our midst, looking for God in the thin place moment, sensing divine presence in ordinary things. Then he said there are those that are committed to the life of holiness, committed to virtues, strengthening the virtues, weakening the vices. And then he said there are others that are committed to what he calls evangelical Christianity in the best sense, which is living with and working with and making sense of the word within the word, people gathering in small groups to discern uh, in this day and time what God would have us do and who God would have us be. And then there is the, the spiritual stream. The one that resonates with me the most is the Church of the Savior in Washington, D.C., especially uh, Elizabeth O'Connor, who describes the spiritual journey as you go inward to discover who you are in Christ, to go upward to explore what it means to live under the, the rule of the divine maker and outward from there to caring for others. The three movements of the spiritual life, first inward, second upward, third outward. And then he goes on to describe the compassionate life. When the sacraments take on new meaning, meaning when we look for uh, God, the invisible in the visible, when we begin to see our work as a calling of God. And then finally, there is the social justice version of Christianity extending compassion to everyone in life. I would submit to you that a mature Christian has a commitment to prayer, has a commitment to holiness, has a commitment to the word, especially in small groups, has a commitment to the spirit-filled life, and has a commitment to the compassionate life, and maybe, maybe has a commitment to social justice in the vein of the prophets and Jesus. My first journey was through all of that. I was young and I didn't know how to be a Christian and so I learned to pay attention to God with some friends through young life. 
I worked on ethics in terms of my uh, doctoral work, and so I was interested in virtue and vice. I seem to be highly skilled at vice and still working on the flowering of virtues. I didn't know the Bible growing up, and so I went through the evangelical experience, and I've been teaching Bible classes every year since 1973, and I've learned that those who sit together in study and try to make the sense of the word, well, stuff happens. It is the single most important part in terms of practice for a Christian who's serious about being Christian. I finally learned what the spiritual life is because I didn't know what people meant when they talked about the Holy Spirit. I sure as heck did not want to jump over chairs and raise my hands and go crazy. Rather, I learned a little bit more of the quieter way of being spirit-filled in the Quaker way. And then gradually, as I've gotten older, I've entered into the sacramental life, recognizing that there's a lot of mystery in the sacraments. They're visible signs of very important realities. But there is the social justice phase of my life. When I went to seminary, I had three professors, all of them very famous, in teaching Old Testament studies. James Luther Mays, who taught at Union Seminary, Patrick Miller, who taught at Princeton, and Paul Hansen, who taught at Harvard Divinity School. Those guys, through work, put my nose into the prophets and demystified these strange words that come from the prophets. They taught me about Christianity as more than personal piety. That real, vibrant Christianity has got to have something to do with care for the others with a big O, for those who are excluded, for those who live at the far fringes of life. How we treat those people points back to us in terms of the quality and the depth and the sincerity of our commitment to walk in the way of Jesus. I remember two passages in particular from those professors. One was from Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1, focusing on worship. It's a criticism of people who walk in the church Sunday morning, week after week, and frankly are unmoved by the troubles of broken people in the world. When you come to appear before me, who ask this from your hand, trample my courts no more, Bringing offerings is futile. Incense is abandoned as an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and callings of convocations, I cannot endure solemn assemblies with inequity. Your new moons and your appointed festivals, my soul hates. He's talking about ancient worship. They become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make my prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan plead the widow, your story. How deeply are you committed to removal of evil from your own life, to ceasing whatever evil you participate in? How committed are you to learning to do good? How can you learn to do good if you don't hang out with others who are committed to doing good? Do you seek justice? Do you have a history in your life of rescuing the oppressed? Do you defend the orphan? Or do you plead the widow? If there is no history there, then perhaps there's a lot of wishful thinking in your life. And then in in Amos, Amos doesn't mince words. He refused to some women as the cows of Bashan. 
Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on Mount Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to their husbands, bring something to drink. The Lord has sworn by his holiness, the time is surely coming upon you when they take you away with hooks, even the last of you with fish hooks. Through breaches in the wall you shall leave, each one straight ahead, and you shall be flung out into Hermon. And then they hate the one who reproves at the gate. They hate the courts of justice. They abhor the one who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from them levies of grain, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted vision, vineyards that are pleasant, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You afflict the righteous who take a bribe and push aside the needy at the gate. When you are forced to struggle with the implications of the prophetic concerns, you are forced to move beyond your own private personal piety. You're forced to move beyond your own commitment to solar spirituality, only the good stuff. You're forced to be concerned with laments for the darkness in the lands, and you're forced to be committed to social justice. I've been talked to several times by individuals who do not like me using the word social justice. Somebody somewhere has said, don't trust preachers who talk about social justice. Hogwash. All justice is social. All justice is social. Because of those professors, I made a commitment in my first ministry to work at First Presbyterian Church in Charlotte. I was the director of inner city ministries. I worked all day with prostitutes, with Vietnam veterans who were screwed up by the war and on drugs, with people who made stupid decisions about how to handle life and had fallen on the streets and who simply were broken. I learned one reality about poverty. There is a stink to poverty that really awakens you to the brokenness of life, the filthiness and the odors that people bring into the room. But I remember a couple of things that really woke me up. We ran a, a soup kitchen there, and we got in a massive argument about how much food you give to one person versus a family of four or eight. And I happened to quote something from Aristotle, his definition of justice, to each according to his need. And so we sat down and we worked with some dietitians, and we figured out exactly how much food we should give one individual, and two individuals, and three individuals, and four individuals. And we took a bag of Cheerios, and we created a bag of Cheerios appropriate to one person, and to two people, and to three people, and to four. That is doing social justice, reaching out to each according to their need. I also remember a man who came to me over and over and over again, who was a Vietnam vet, who lived under the steps of the church, who was wasted by drugs. I received his social security disability, or his disability check, and I'm the one that would take him to the bank to cash it. I remember one day he came in and he wanted some clothes because it was raining. And he had already been in so many times he aggravated the manure out of me. So I turned him away. And then I got hungry. So I had a Bojangles fried chicken right there in the drive through and out comes cool of one of those big blue garbage containers where he had gone into there and collected uneaten elements of chicken and began to eat. I did not practice justice. 
I was not social in my concern. Social justice reminds us that we are a community of people. Those commitments that I had back in the day to working in the realm of social justice, Bill Dixon reawoken in me. For that, I will be eternally grateful. But it's your story that I'm interested in. How do poor people play in your commitment to Jesus? I submit to you the way you look at poor people says more about you than them. When somebody says to me, why you want to give dollars to the poor out there near the airport? I always say, that says more about you than them. You don't know their story, but I hear your stingy heart. What is your commitment to justice? Which brings me to Jesus. Jesus said that he brings division and he separates people. And there's an element of truth in this. Jesus touched a leper, which rendered him unclean. And he sent a signal to people that we should be willing to work with and live by and touch the very face of a leper to bring them to some kind of new salvation. Jesus went out and talked to that woman who had a checkered life in openness to all of the people looking, he offended the purest because he associated with a woman who had a scarlet letter upon her chest and he welcomed her into the faith. He took people who were blind and uh, the limbs broken and people just, life just did them. And he sought salvation. But what you see in the commitment of Jesus is a commitment to the politics of inclusion. And it's all there. And it's this commitment to the politics of inclusion that is kind of the source of heartburn for a lot of Americans. Because we're called to an openness. Jesus did not ask us to live like this. Jesus asked us to live like this. Prophetic ministry is tied very much into opening up ourselves and to demonstrating the prophetic witness of Jesus, which is that receptivity to the other. See, that's controversial. And it gets into people's own personal politics. But see, if you're a Christian, a real interesting question is how do your politics aligned to the commitments of Jesus. And that's where sometimes division occurs within an individual life, perhaps within a family who aren't in agreement of what it means to take care of the other. We are entering a period where we're going to enter into a conversation about prophetic speech and prophetic imagination. And that means you probably should expect to be a little uncomfortable because the prophetic words of the Bible are uncomfortable. But that's where the real fun of faith begins. And Bill Dixon gave witness to that. And for that, I give him praise. Uh, let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the journeys, our pathways, the various ways that we mature and maybe slide backwards in our faith. We thank you for the sacraments. We thank you for the Bible. We thank you for the community of faith. We thank you for the songs. We thank you for the, the solar part of Christianity, the light stuff, the beautiful stuff that makes us happy. But help us bring into our life an understanding of lament and a concern for the poor. We thank you for the witness of Jesus who had all of that going on in his own life. And it is him that we call Lord and Savior. And so we pray in his holy name, and the people say, Amen. Hear our invitation to discipleship. Jesus said, Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for our souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so if any of you here today are interested in learning more about our church, church membership, or the Christian faith, please speak to one of the pastors, ushers, or leaders of the church with colored name tags at the end of the service. If you're watching this via video and are interested, please contact our church office using the information found on the screen. More information is found in your bulletin. And now let us stand together and say what we believe. Our affirmation of faith comes from a brief statement of faith from the Book of Confessions. Let us say what we believe. In life and in death, we belong to God through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. We trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, who proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. We trust in God, who in sovereign love created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people to live as one. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the Church. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth praying, Come, Lord Jesus! With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray together. Let us keep silence. Almighty and gracious God, we have heard this day the challenge that issues forth from taking your word seriously, calling us to care, calling us to open our hearts and minds and souls, not only to you, but to the other. Your prophetic word challenges us to be more than simply Christians who come and sit in pews in nice buildings. You call us to justice, to truth, to compassion. Your word demands it, and your Christ spoke to us out of his love for us, showing us the way. And so we seek to follow him 
O God, our rock and redeemer and solace for all who call on your name, we behold the vision of your holy splendor and bow down before you in humble submission. You humble us always with your truth. You are God. There is no other. All else fades and withers while you endure throughout the ages. You are beyond understanding, and yet your grace abounds. We receive of its abundance. You exceed our expectations and needs. There is never a day that we cannot list the manifold gifts of your abounding love. From morning until nightfall, we are upheld by your encompassing care. Having been raised by Christ, we will set our minds on your splendor. We will trust your Holy Spirit to guide us when earthly desires distract us. It is by your grace that we have been empowered to put on the new nature that Christ bestows. And so claiming our inheritance as your daughters and sons, we move into the world as witnesses to and of your love. Let us not covet what our neighbors enjoy. Prevent our worship of false gods and stop our tongues when we would slander a brother or sister. When we eat, make us mindful that you are the source of all nourishment. When we drink, may it be the cup of new life. Help us to be glad in the joy of the Spirit as we give you the glory and honor. Always do your holy name. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 talks about a commitment to... um, be renewed in the mind and to be thoughtful about uh, our worship, which is not just what we do here, but it's the the worship that we bring in the world, uh, the way we deploy our life energies for all that God needs us to do and for what God wants us to do, not only as individuals, but also as families. And even beyond that, uh, as as this particular witness of Christ, Webster Presbyterian Church, uh, being thoughtful about what we are called to do and how we are called to be in the world. So let's keep that in mind as our stewardship moment.
Let us pray. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your humble servants, give you thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of life, but above all, for your immeasurable love and the redemption of our world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and the hope of glory. And we pray that you would give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truthfully thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives by offering ourselves to your service and by walking before you in truth and righteousness all of our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray in the way he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated for the charge and blessing, and remain seated for the postlude. May God the Father prepare your journey, Jesus the Son guide your footsteps, the Spirit of life strengthen your body, the three-in-one watch over you on every road that you may follow. <laughs> 